Welcome back to Clinicians Brief, the podcast, where we get to delve into the conversations behind all of our content. I'm your host, Dr. Alyssa Watson, and I'm so excited for today's episode because it's a little different than most of our regular episodes. Our guest today actually isn't a veterinarian, and I think once I explain the topic of today's conversation, you all at home will know why. We're going to be talking about an intriguing topic, compounding transdermal medications in cats. And so we all know cats can be notoriously difficult to medicate. (laughs) That makes transdermal administration a potential game changer, but only if the drug's efficacy aligns. And unfortunately, we also know that a lot of drugs just aren't reliably absorbed when they're administered transdermally. So our guest today, Dr. Lauren Forsyth, is uniquely qualified to help us understand the intricacies of this topic. She is not only an accomplished pharmacist, but she's also an assistant professor at the University of Finley, where she earned her pharmacy degree. She's going to bring us a wealth of knowledge in the realm of veterinary pharmacology, and she has authored the book, Drug Compounding for Veterinary Professionals. So I'm so excited to have this conversation. This is actually not your first time on the show. You have been on the show previously, but it was before I hosted. So this is your first time with me. How are you doing today? I'm good. Thank you. Great, great. Could you take just a minute and uh, walk our audience through um, your background, uh, the the special training that you've had in veterinary pharmacy? Um, tell us how you got where you are today. Well, I say that I grew up on the floor of a vet clinic. My parents were both veterinarians and they bought their own mixed animal practice right before I was born. And so I spent a lot of time um, in that practice. They were the only two doctors and did 24 seven emergencies and any animal that walked in the door. And uh, so I got exposed to a lot, but I also very quickly figured out I didn't want to be a vet. (laughs) And I really liked healthcare and the animal side of things, but I uh, just, vet med was not for me, I didn't think. And so I ended up at pharmacy school. And I went to pharmacy school thinking I was going to work in retail pharmacy, um, just at a local chain and have time to show my horses. But halfway through pharmacy school, my compounding professor found out about my background and asked if I had considered veterinary pharmacy as a specialty. And I'm like, huh, I didn't know that was a thing, but that sounds perfect. And that worked out well because I hadn't found any area of human pharmacy I really loved yet, Uh, but that pharmacy sounded great. So I pursued that. And once I graduated, I was um, offered the position as the first veterinary pharmacy resident at Purdue's Veterinary Teaching Hospital. So I had my human doctor of pharmacy degree. And then after graduation, I spent a year at Purdue uh, working in their teaching hospital and learning how to apply that to the veterinary uh, sector. I then went uh, out to California, and I spent three years as a clinical veterinary pharmacist at UC Davis uh, Vet School uh, before deciding that I missed the cornfields, I missed the Midwest, and so I headed back to Illinois, and I had the opportunity to revamp their pharmacy service and their teaching hospital, uh, where I spent four years as the pharmacy service head and a clinical assistant professor um, at the College of Vet Med. Uh, Recently, though, uh, we decided for the family and work-life balance, it was a good chance to move a little bit closer to family. So we moved to Ohio uh, just a few months ago, and I am now an assistant professor of social and administrative pharmacy at the University of Findlay, which is where I got my pharmacy degree and got my first start into veterinary pharmacy. Uh, I still work with the University of Illinois in a part-time capacity, helping with their controlled substance surveillance program at this point in time. Uh, But my my full-time gig is teaching pharmacy students how to manage aspects of their practice. Um, Along this path, I've decided that my passion really stems from my background and growing up seeing how my parents functioned in general practice and seeing all of the different aspects where they're asked to do things related to medications that they really didn't get education on in vet school. So they are managing their inventory, their controlled substances, determining what they should use compounds for, what they should use approved products for, medication counseling, uh, working with clients to increase that med compliance, handling medication errors, things that I had a lot of education on in pharmacy school. And so I realized I really enjoy those more administrative aspects of veterinary pharmacy and helping veterinarians uh, figure out how to apply those 
when they maybe didn't learn all of that in vet school because they were busy learning how to treat their patients. So that's where I, how I ended up with this controlled substance, compounding um, interest and focus of my veterinary pharmacy aspect. Yeah, that is, that's an incredible journey. You've been both coasts and um, that I'm just, Fantastic. And I love the fact that, you know, your parents had had a practice that they owned. I'm from Iowa originally. And so we ended up out here on the West Coast. Um, but then my whole family came out here. So it's doubtful I'll ever go back home to the Midwest. <laughs> but um, So yeah, so let's dive into this because I can tell you're incredibly passionate about it. And I'm so excited about that because as you kind of alluded to, I felt like this was an area that I didn't get a lot of training in. And I feel like there are, you know, um, changes, you know, that happen. There's updates in regulations and things like that. And so it's something that you really kind of need to stay on top of. Um, and so having a resource like you to help veterinarians out there so that they can, they know what they're supposed to be doing, what, you know, especially like you said, with those FDA uh, approved products, you know, when can we, can we deviate from those? When can we be using compounded medications? Um, because a lot of that's changing recently. So transdermal, you know, compounding for transdermal drug delivery, this is, I mean, this is cat's just jump to the top of your your mind here, right? Because cats are so hard to medicate. Um, they, they, oftentimes don't take pills. They oftentimes foam and get, you know, upset about oral suspensions. And so they have that nice little ear with the thin skin there, you know, all ready to put some medicine on. Um, so can you uh, elaborate kind of on the specific benefits of the root of, um, you know, administering medications transdermally to cat patients specifically? Well, like you said, cats are not the most compliant of patients. It's hard to explain to a cat why they need to take their daily blood pressure medication um, and have them listen. So we have to get a little bit creative on how we get these pills into our resistant patients and how we uh, facilitate clients doing that. And transdermal is a really appealing option for that. It would be great if we could put everything but the kitchen sink across the skin. Mm -hmm. um, it usually is easier uh, for administration. I do add the caveat with that when I'm teaching people about transdermal, that it's not necessarily the cat's going to lay them in purr while you rub this into their ear. Uh, I had a cat that I needed to administer a transdermal medication to at one point. And yes, I could administer the medication, which was an improvement over oral, but I was still like sitting on the cat to get the medication administered and bribing retreats. So it wasn't the most perfect, delightful process still, but it was doable. And that's the goal with transdermal is we make medication administration doable for clients, uh, which is great. We also have some benefits of maybe being able to avoid some adverse effects from oral because we're not sending the medication through the GI tract. So we can decrease some of the potential topical irritation from oral administration. And then what are some of the potential downsides to transdermal medications? I mean, do they have, you know, specific adverse effects that are, are um, because of, you know, the vehicle they're in or because of the way we're utilizing that drug? The main adverse effect we worry about with transdermal are irritation to the site of application and lack of efficacy. So with the irritation, uh, we're putting some sort of drug on the ear. It's going to sit there and it has the potential to cause irritation, especially because if we look at the safety data sheets for these drugs, a lot of them are listed as topical irritants. And that can be a problem. We also have concern with irritation from the base. Now, a little bit of irritation is not always a bad thing because when the skin's a little bit inflamed, it is more permeable to drugs. So that can help increase drug absorption, but too much irritation can lead to having to discontinue the drug. So we need to monitor and have a plan to help prevent that where we can do that to some extent with cleaning the ear sufficiently. I always recommend clients are told to wipe off any remaining drug from the previous dose prior to applying the next one. And Patients that aren't getting irritation, you, usually water is sufficient. But if an animal starts to have signs of irritation from the application, using a over-the-counter ear cleaner instead of just straight water can be what it needs to keep that irritation minimal so that the drug can continue being administered. 
with the lack of efficacy, that's our other big problem. And that's why it's so important to consider our formulation of our transdermals and the drugs that we're choosing to use by this route. Yeah, that's definitely something that I always, I kind of forget as technically an adverse drug reaction, but but not working is an adverse drug reaction. And so, um, you know, keeping that in mind. Um, so you talked a little bit about, about cleaning. Also, do you generally recommend rotating the ear when we're applying medications to the ear or what other areas can we apply medications transdermally? I definitely recommend alternating ears. And so I don't recommend doing transdermals where you split the dose over both ears because then you're using both ears every dose and the ears don't get a break. But I do recommend alternating ears so that each ear is getting a break um, for a dose so that you can help decrease the irritation that way. You could potentially consider other sites. And for the idea of compounded transdermals that are creams, type consistency or gels that we're putting on the ear. The ear is the go-to place. It is thin skin, the blood vessels are close to the surface, um, and it's relatively hairless. Also, it's not easily accessible for grooming. The abdomen can be relatively hairless. It's also somewhat thin skin. The, it's, the um, fat tissue makes the absorption a little less typically, but it could still be useful. As far as a transdermal site, the problem is grooming, where the transdermal might end up becoming an oral medication at that point. So we mentioned in the introduction, you know, that not all drugs are suitable for transdermal delivery. In fact, I know um, one of the drugs that's being studied right now, or at least I've seen a couple different articles recently, is like transdermal application of gabapentin. Um, and we, you know, that the studies that I have seen at least did not really demonstrate, like you said, you know, not so much lack of efficacy, but definitely lack of, you know, showing um, uh, medication levels in the bloodstream compared to oral administration. Um, so can you kind of explain, you know, how, how that mechanism works? Um, and then do you know of other medications that, you know, have been studied, but not, might not be effective in a transdermal form for kitties? Uh, for tr getting transdermals, uh, drugs administered successfully, we need to get the drug to cross over the skin and then get into the bloodstream. And the skin, the top layer is the stratum corneum. And that's going to be our rate limiting step is getting it through that barrier of the skin and into the dermal layer where the blood vessels are and it can get into the absorption, the systemic absorption. With Getting it across the stratum corneum, there's some different things we can consider. Um, penetration enhancers are different chemicals that may or may not be present. Um, and even water can fall into a penetration enhancer category with regards to affecting the stratum corneum to help drug cross the skin. Also using drugs that the molecule size is smaller means that we have a smaller molecule to get through the skin, which is helpful. Uh, the we also have aspects we don't completely understand about the different um, skin, such as are there enzymes that might metabolize the drug on its way through the skin? And we think that there might be in cat skin, but we don't know a ton about them and how to utilize those uh, with determining our transdermal dosing and what's going to be effective. So a lot of our transdermal effort is based on figuring out what gets absorbed and how those systemic levels compare to oral levels and or therapeutic levels. And um, with drugs that um, do and don't work, there's a number of studies out there, and um, some of them show that we can get good levels. Some of them don't. And the biggest class that I urge caution with, or complete avoidance, really, of transdermal administration is antibiotics. There's a couple studies looking at antibiotics. There was one older study, I think early 2000s, that looked at enrofloxacin administered transdermally, found it did not get um, sufficient levels after three days of dosing. And we're really concerned about the resistance potential of those antibiotics, because if we're putting something transdermal, it it probably is not getting absorbed very well. But if it does, it's getting absorbed in likely more slowly than oral therapy would and not reaching the same systemic levels we would reach with oral antibiotic therapy. So if we're getting it in there, we're probably getting it in there just enough to 
push for some resistance of our bug and not actually treat it. Yeah. Um, so I don't think it is really an ethical choice to use a transdermal antibiotic um, based on the information we have on their absorption. Yeah, that's a really good point, especially with, like you said, things like enroflexin that are really going to be peak dependent. Um, you know, we really want that high concentration. And so um, that actually brings me to my next question, though, which is, is there a difference? I feel kind of silly asking this, but is there a difference between topical medications and transdermal medication? Or because oftentimes I feel like people use those interchangeably. I do think we use them interchangeably, but technically they are different. Topical um, should apply, imply that the medication is being applied to a local site with intentions of only acting at that local site. An ophthalmic drop, topical. It's designed to have effect on the eye and not systemic. An otic medication would be topical, designed to have um, effects just on the ear, not systemically. Um, and if you think about a topical antibiotic, maybe you're putting it on a wound to help treat and prevent infection at that site, you're not looking for it to have systemic levels. When we talk about transdermal medications, we're looking to get systemic blood levels um, of the medication. So it can treat a systemic disease, not just a local um, issue. Thank you. So let's talk about, you know, the, the FDA approved transdermal preparations. Um, and I specifically want to talk about, you know, the reliability and efficacy of those when we're comparing them to compounded transdermal medications. And we're going to be talking specifically about three different medications after the break today. Um, but kind of can you compare and contrast those? When we say that a drug is FDA approved, it means that uh, the manufacturer has proven to the FDA that the drug is safe and effective when used in the way that they have it labeled. They also, as part of approval, have to have their manufacturing process approved by the FDA and the labeling that goes on that drug. And then they have to do testing on each batch to prove that each batch of that drug has the correct amount of drug in it. And all of that has to occur before it ever reaches your shelf. So with FDA-approved products, we do have some guarantees, especially when we're using them as labeled. Compounded products don't have to go through that um, FDA approval, so they have not necessarily proven safety and efficacy. We might have studies out there that look at those things for the drugs, but they're not FDA approval level studies in most cases. And then we, with compounds, get that batch-to-batch -batch variability. Compounding pharmacies are operate on United States Pharmacopeia or USP standards, and these are general best practices for compounding, but they're designed for what is a reasonable standard for making a patient-specific medication. They're not designed for large scale like manufacturing standards are, and so they don't require testing every batch to show that it contains the amount of drug it sets. Um, it also means that you can have variability in how the drug is made from one pharmacy to the next. So with our transdermal compounds, we have the risk that each batch we get of the compound could have too much or too little drug. Maybe it's not stable. Maybe it's made correctly initially, but there's something in there that causes the drug to degrade. And so we have um, lost a lot of our active drug before the beyond use state that is on that drug. Um, it could also not get absorbed. There's a ton of different bases that we could put our transdermal drug into and package as a transdermal, and they'll work differently. Uh, so if we switch bases, we could potentially have differences in efficacy from one to the other. With an FDA-approved product, we are getting the same quality, same product, same formulation every single time we reach for that. And I'm going to take that one step further because all veterinarians are going to do this is when we get this product in and if it's FDA approved for transdermal use, you know, in cats, the very first, the very next patient you're going to have is a dog with similar clinical signs. That's a chihuahua or something little. And my mind says, oh, I wonder if I could just put this cat medication on the dog. Um, what, it, what do you say to that? The short answer is you could put it on there. There's no guarantee it's going to work. Um, but there, it's because there's differences in the skin. And yes, we legally can use that extra label. So using that approved product in a dog versus making a separate compound of it for the dog is the better choice to use the approved one. At least you know it is guaranteed to be what it says. Now, it may not work. And that's because it was formulated and proven to be safe and effective based on all the characteristics of cat skin. 
Um, dog skin, different thickness, different characteristics, those um, metabolic enzymes I mentioned that we know very little about, probably present in both species, but probably different in both species. And again, something we know very little about. And so there's no guarantee it's going to work. And it's very much extra label, unstudied use at that point. I just wanted to ask kind of the similar question about transmucosal uh, medications, just because I know that this is something that gets debated a lot um, in uh, my Facebook groups and things like that. You know, so if we're giving a medication that's labeled for use transmucosally in kitties, uh, do we have those same concerns in dogs? But, Potentially. Yeah. Um, I don't know that it's quite as hard to get it across the mucosal as it is for a transdermal cream, but you do have differences in the characteristics um, of the skin between the two species, and you have differences in the amount of volume that you can get across the mucosa without it actually being swallowed, because once it gets swallowed, you end up with a whole different capacity of problems. Plums is putting the support you need in one place. Building on 30 years of providing accurate drug information to veterinarians, Plums is branching out to give you day-to-day, patient-to-patient support. With faster search, intuitive navigation, and unprecedented new tools like the Drug Interaction Checker, you'll be prepared for whatever practice brings. Plan on maximum prescribing support at Plums.com. we've gotten a good background on, you know, transdermal medications and how, you know, how they're prepared. Um, Let's talk specifically about the three medications that you talk about in your clinician's brief article. Um, And we're going to start with methimazole because that's the one that honestly I have the most uh, experience with. Um, It's one that I've used for years and years and years. And I oftentimes have uh, compounded, uh, usually get that, you know, through an online pharmacy, like you said, a compounding pharmacy pharmacy and have it just sent directly to the client. What are the advantages of transdermal methimazole compared to oral methimazole? Because there's a, you know, there's a FDA approved oral product as well. The transdermal methimazole is Uh, probably the one that has the most data of any compounded transdermal regarding its efficacy. There's many studies out there that show that it does work by this formulation, and we can have pretty good faith in our dosing and our use of this medication, even though it's not FDA approved. Uh, And it really does have a good place in therapy. For these hyperthyroid cats, we're treating them generally lifelong in many cases, and administering an oral medication um, once or twice a day for the rest of a cat's life could be quite a burden on a client and not feasible, but we know that we need this consistent administration to effectively treat our hyperthyroidism and keep the euthyroid. So it ends up with a lot of benefit from the client standpoint. And then a common adverse effect that we see with the oral methimazole is that they get GI side effects from it. And that's likely due to the topical irritation of that drug in their GI tract. So by giving a transdermal, there is a study that shows that the GI side effects are less likely to occur with the transdermal formulation. Not completely eliminated, but less. And so it can be a good option to try if GI side effects are causing issues with the oral therapy. Along those lines, what if we have some of those more severe, you know, adverse drug effects from methimazole? I personally have had a case, a really severe case of facial excoriation, um, where it within, you know, starting the medication, um, and that medication was given orally, um, but within, you know, just a few days of starting the medication, the cat was was violently scratching at the face, you know, causing really horrific self mutilation, self trauma. Um, are, and also, you know, I believe that I haven't, I haven't seen it, but I know that you can have, you know, a hepatopathy, you know, and other things that can go along with methimazole. So if you have those cases with those severe reactions, not the mild GI upset, are transdermal um, uh, options, is that something that you, you can use in those cases? 
Unfortunately, no. The severe side effects are a reaction to the um, drug molecule itself, not to the route of administration. So those are likely going to continue with transdermal administration as well. And in this case, you would need to consider an alternative treatment for the hyperthyroidism besides methimazole. What about monitoring? So when when cats are receiving transdermal methimazole, do we monitor that exactly the same as when we have kitties on oral? Mostly. A few caveats to that, though. Uh, transdermal uh, treatment will likely take a little bit longer to get the cat euthyroid than oral treatment. We're not talking extensive lengths of time, but we're talking maybe an extra week or so. So you might want to push out your initial monitoring or at least maintain that dose a little bit longer initially before you decide if you need to have treatment adjustments. Uh, but once you get that cat on it, you can generally do the monitoring the same way. You're looking for the same efficacy and adverse effect markers with oral versus transdermal. Uh, with the transdermal though, because it's a compound, you would want to monitor if they are switching. So if the client decides they're going to switch which compounding pharmacy they get the compound from, mm -hmm. then you would want to double check um, levels a few weeks after they start the new formulation because different pharmacies could use different bases to make it, and that could result in different amounts of absorption. Um, also, if you notice um, unexpected changes in your monitoring parameters, um, considering whether it could have been related to the batch of compound that was received is something to keep in the back of your mind for the transdermal. That's really good advice. You also, in the article, talk about safe handling, um, specifically of methimazole, um, because it's classified as a hazardous drug. Uh, could you elaborate on the precautions that veterinary professionals, as well as you know, our, our clients you know, who are administering this medication at home, need to be, need to be taking? Mm -hmm. So with the hazardous drug, uh, we want to keep in mind that it's the hazardous drug classification is based on their hazards to humans. So we are uh, aware that this is a potential. And if we've designed something to go across feline skin, there is very much a potential it could also go across human skin. So we need to make sure that any transdermal clients need to be wearing gloves when they administer it, uh, but especially with methimazole, um, keeping the two because depending on how the transdermal is packaged, you might end up with some drug on the outside. So cleaning that off with alcohol swabs afterwards could be helpful if it's getting on the packaging. Making sure that handling of the transdermal medication is limited to only those who really need to be handling it. So it's not something that you send the kid to go get out of the cabinet and bring to you. It's something you limit to just the person administering the drug. And then making sure that it's rubbed in well into the cat's ear each time a dose is given and keeping the cat away from other animals or people that might rub up against it for an hour or so after administration can be helpful as well. Um, veterinary professionals should limit their handling of it. Um, if you're compounding it, it has to be done with um, complete USP 800, which is hazardous drug compounding compliance. That's likely not applying to our veterinary professionals. That's probably more specific to the pharmacy side. Mm -hmm. um, but veterinary professionals should make sure it indicates that they should be wearing gloves when they hold it. They should make sure clients are aware to wear gloves and that it is potentially hazardous. And if someone's pregnant, they should do what they can to avoid having to administer it or handle it. Yep, that was the, the big one I knew that definitely should not be handled by by women who are, are pregnant. So um, let's move on to phenobarbital, okay? So phenobarbital, this one, um, you know, I haven't used as much as methimazole. I think I've used it a few times in my career, um, but I, I love that it can be administered transdermally because phenobarb, you know, is truly considered, you know, one of the first line treatments for seizure disorders in cats. Um, are there advantages to transdermal phenobarb, uh, you know, other, other than the ease of administration, you know, kind of like that overarching transdermal is easier in cats, hopefully, <laughs> um, you know, are there any other uh, advantages to administering phenobarbital this way? Uh, not really like there is methimazole. Uh, the ease of administration is the biggest one because, again, we mm -hmm. want clients to be consistent. And so if clients are not capable of consistently giving the oral, that's when we, when we would reach for the transdermal phenobarb. Um, but the oral is going to be our best bet um, if they can get it into the cat reliably. Okay. And then in general, 
um, the side effect profile of phenobarbital in cats really isn't quite as severe as it is in dogs. Um, however, we still do see some things. We can sometimes see hepatic enzyme elevations and things like that. Um, do uh, I also read when I was doing my homework for this episode that um, transdermal preparations seem to need a, a significantly larger dose to achieve those therapeutic levels than when we're giving it uh, orally. And so does that higher dose, do we see more of these uh, adverse effects like hepatic enzyme elevations or, or do you find that that affects it at all? Uh, we do still have to do the same monitoring. The transdermal side effect profile is expected to be similar to the oral um, with that potential for hepatic enzyme elevations. The reason we're using the higher doses is because in the study that is available on transdermal phenobarb, it shows that to get to effective blood levels, um, the same blood levels we would be aiming for with oral, we need the higher doses. We aren't reaching those blood levels with the lower uh, phenobarb doses. And so theoretically, by treating to the same blood levels, we should be getting about the same hepatic profile. That said, uh, there could be delayed absorption from the phenobarb that is going to cause issues um, long term if it starts to build up. There could be um, delayed effects on the hepatic enzymes. Those are all theoretical. So they're worth monitoring for and keeping in mind. And again, using oral if at all possible, because we just know more about it. Mm -hmm. And I think, uh, like you said, monitoring for um, inflammation in the ears or something that might change, you know, if they're getting more. Are there, are there unique challenges to those really higher dose requirements, um, you know, when the, the compounding pharmacist is making, making that medication? We have to make sure we can get a sufficient concentration into the base. And the, uh, while the phenobarb doses are higher for transdermal than they are for oral, the, it's not that high that it's super difficult to get into the base. Um, it might increase the volume that has to be administered slightly, but in my experience, you can max out your volume at about a quarter mil of um, gel and still get that to rub into the cat's ear okay. And generally we're going much lower than that on our volumes, even with the little bit higher dosing. Okay. The last medication that we're gonna talk about is fluoxetine. And um, this one was a little bit unique with the three medications that we're talking about today because its efficacy really isn't as proven as methimazole or phenobarb, at least according to your article. So um, can you, Tell us, you know, the challenges associated with assessing the efficacy of transdermal fluoxetine. Yeah, um, it is different than the other two. Methimazole and phenobarb um, show examples of transdermal medications that are really well designed to prove efficacy or lack thereof. Because methimazole, we have a thyroid level that we are aiming for. We have a specific number that says this drug is effective. Uh, for phenobarb, we have a specific blood level that we say this is our therapeutic blood level that we need to get to. So those are very specific targets to say, yes, it works or no, it doesn't. Fluoxetine doesn't really have that. We don't have defined blood levels of what we want for treatment. And a lot of times we're treating to things that are a little bit open for interpretation. Um, um, on anxiety and other behavioral issues in cats. So that makes it difficult to determine if it's completely effective. Yeah, definitely. When we have some of those more subjective uh, endpoints, it can be, it can be harder. Um, I did see that one study found that the relative bioavailability of the transdermal formulation was, was very, very low. Like, something like 10% of the oral formulation. So why did you still feel like it was important to discuss this medication, you know, in your article and with us today? Well, you actually bring up something that has an interesting story behind it. So fluoxetine, um, you're right, you're referencing a study, I believe, from somewhat early in the 2000s, where they did show it's about 10% bioavailable compared to the oral. Um, and so that is a huge difference, but that study alone doesn't mean that we should be dosing transdermal fluoxetine at 10 times the oral dose, because that was a single dose pharmacokinetic study. And we're not using fluoxetine as a single dose drug. We're using it over long periods of time. We know orally it takes a while to reach effectiveness. So um, do we know transdermally that it doesn't reach effectiveness over an extended period? And that was a question that I asked as a resident, which led to my research project for my residency, which was looking at um, 60 days of transdermal fluoxetine versus oral fluoxetine 
to see if we were getting comparable blood levels between the two. And we ended up, we did not do 10 times the oral dose. We ended up doing a uh, five megs per kg dose. So five times the one meg per kg oral dose and capped it out at 25 megs per cat. If uh, the cat was weight enough that their calculated dose would have been higher. And we looked at that over a two month time span. Um, we also looked at administration of that one meg per kg oral dose to see how our blood levels compared. And we found that after day 14, there was a significant difference between oral and transdermal. However, during the uh, first 14 days, those blood levels were not significantly different. Uh, the After that 14 days, transdermal fluoxetine still had blood levels. They just weren't nearly as high as the oral ones. The question that was not answered in my study was, do we need those super high levels that the oral was producing to have clinical efficacy? And the way my residency was a year, I was limited on what I could do. Mm -hmm. So I didn't look at clinical efficacy in my study. It was all healthy cats. Mm -hmm. And that does still leave the question, is it effective clinically? And it's still being used. It's out there. It's something that I know veterinarians commonly reach for. And behavioral medications are something that we often want to do transdermally because if we already have a cat that's stressed and having behavioral issues, we don't want to add more stress by forcing oral administration um, of these medications that are supposed to help. So that was uh, the reason why I thought it was important to include. And it makes a nice contrast to the other two that are very clearly defined with those specific mm -hmm. numerical number sure. markers of yep. efficacy. Yep. Same thing. Back to that gabapentin. I know everybody wants gabapentin to work for that exact same reason. <laughs> Um, so how do you advise practitioners, like in that specific scenario, how can we weigh the benefits of using the compounded transdermal fluoxetine against those challenges and limitations that you just brought up? I always go back to, for any transdermal, there needs to be a reason why you can't use the oral. Transdermal should not be the first thing you reach for. Um, you should have a try the oral or you've tried enough oral medications to know you can't get them into a cat, a specific cat. And then you need to, then you can consider transdermal. And at that point, if you've tried oral in the cat and you know it works, the client just can't get it in reliably, then you could try the transdermal and see if you still see the same level of efficacy. If you, the owner's like, yeah, I can't get an oral medication into this cat at all. I'm not even trying it. And you go for that transdermal fluoxetine first, have a specific plan with that client for monitoring. What does success look like for them? Um, whatever you're trying to treat, what will that client consider being successful? And define that before you start treatment. That way you know what you're looking for. And then have a plan to evaluate that. Um, and it's likely going to rely on client report. And does the client think it's improving? But if they have a plan of what they're looking for, they can often determine that. And I find the behavioral things are a lot of times things the clients are bringing to the veterinarian mm -hmm. and saying, this is a problem for me. I need you to fix it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So as we wrap up the discussion today, um, do you have any other pearls or key insights that you want our audience as veterinarians to gain from your really unique and wonderful perspective as a pharmacist. I, this has been just a great conversation and I wanted to give you the opportunity to, to share any other knowledge with us that you wanted. <laughs> um, I always like to caution veterinarians to think critically about the compounds that you're requesting to have made. Uh, transdermals are a great example. It's not hard to make a transdermal. There's pre-made basis. There's pure drug powder for m most drugs. You can do the math, mix them together, and put them in pretty packaging. Now you have a transdermal. That does not mean it's going to work, and it doesn't mean we should do that for everything. Um, However, I've run into lots of issues where the pharmacist will say, I don't have veterinary experience or enough of it. If the veterinarian asks for it, I'm going to assume it'll work and I'll make it. If, and the veterinarian is saying, well, I don't have compounding experience. So if the pharmacist says they'll make it, then I'm going to, then it should work. And now we have an issue where both professions are assuming the other one is fact-checking them, uh, which may not always be the case. So it's really important to think critically and um, have a reason for the transdermal and ask questions. Um, have a discussion with the pharmacist and work together to determine if something's a reasonable option to give by that route. Yeah, that's great advice. Just open up that line of communication there and, and ask. So, so 
Since the last time that you have been on the show, we have added another segment. This is at the end of our episodes, we play a little game. It's just a fun, would you rather? That's our rapid fire questions. We call this segment rapid fire and it's just for fun. It is a series of would you rather questions. And I was hoping that you would want to play with us before I let you go today. Sure. That sounds like fun. All right. So would, oh, and these were kind of hard for me because I'm, I'm normally write these for veterinarians. So <laughs> I hope they make sense from a pharmacy standpoint. <laughs> okay. So would you rather be stuck counting pills for an entire day without a single break or have to explain all the side effects of every medication in rhyme for an entire week? Oh, I would totally go counting the pills. <laughs> You're not a rhymer. <laughs> No, not at all. <laughs> would you rather repeat your veterinary pharmacy residency or would you rather repeat high school? Veterinary pharmacy residency, hands down. Hands down. I was, was so glad to get out of high school. <laughs> it was awesome. And like you had such a passion for it. So it all was right. high on exposure, low on sleep, but I did mostly enjoy it. Would you rather be the pharmacist in a small town where you where every single resident knows who you are, where you live, or would you rather be the pharmacist in a really large city, but not really get to connect with any of your patients? Small town. I, I like you, the connection. I knew you were going to say that. That's especially, why I came back to the Midwest. Especially after the story about your parents. I knew you were going to say that. Okay. Would you rather work at a new university every year or never be able to leave your current position? Oh, I would say probably never leave my current position. I'm sick and tired of moving. Yeah. All right. Last question. Would you rather be cast as a medieval apothecary in a fantasy TV show or go on tour with a live stand-up comedy routine about being a pharmacist? Medieval apothecary. apothecary. That sounds like fun. Yeah, it does. It does. I also, there's something a little bit stressful about being live too. So. Yes. Well, that was everything. I am so glad that you were able to join us, um, share all of your expertise on all of these uh, compounding as well as just, you know, uh, transdermal drugs in general. Um, I'm sure this conversation has helped our audience. I know it's definitely helped me. Um, so thank you again to our listeners and we hope you'll join us again for some more fascinating conversations. Thank you for having me. Thank you all for listening to today's episode of Clinicians Brief, the podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, you can find us wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts, including a video version that we have on YouTube. While you're there, make sure you subscribe, rate, and review us. You can also listen to or watch our podcast episodes on our website at cliniciansbrief.com slash podcasts. Or if you'd like, drop us a line at podcasts at vetmedics.com. Clinicians Brief the Podcast is a Vet Medics production produced by Alexis Ussery and hosted by me, Dr. Alyssa Watson.